meditation of each and every one of our hearts right there. Please God, he is our rock and our redeemer. April 20th, 1999, Littleton, Colorado, Columbine High School. April 24th, 2003, just four years and four days later, Redline, Pennsylvania, Junior High School. October 3rd, 2006, Lancaster, PA, Nickel Mines, Amish School. April 16th, 2007, Blackburg, Virginia, Virginia Tech. And now we add to this list, and I might add that last yesterday as I was reviewing this list, there are an obscene amount, an obscene number of schools listed. And if you ever want to see something that is heartbreaking, do a search on school shootings. I didn't have the time today to read all the places and all the people who have been killed in school shootings. But today we add December 14, 2012, Newtown, Connecticut, Sandy Hook Elementary School. Six teachers senselessly slaughtered. 20 first graders murdered in their classrooms. As I listened to the reports from the various news agencies, as I read the various articles, one question kept coming up. One question kept being asked, and there was no answer to be found. Why? Why would someone do this? Why would a 20-year-old man go into a school and open fire on teachers and first graders killing 26 people. What could have possibly motivated this action? They continue to search for a motive, but what could motivate such evil? As I heard this question asked over and over and over again, as I read it asked again and again in different articles, I couldn't help but think of the passage for today. The passage that was just read for you by Brian just a few moments ago about the martyrs in heaven. They're in heaven and they're calling out to God. They've been murdered for their faith. They've been murdered because they were unwilling to compromise their testimony to Jesus. They were killed because of it. They became Christian martyrs and they had a question for the Almighty God. And their question was this, How long, O Lord and King, holy and true, how long, they asked, will you wait to bring judgment upon the earth? How long will it be until you pay back those people who killed us? I think there's something in our human nature that craves an explanation. There's something that longs for understanding. There's a desire for us to know what happened, why, and a desire to know that things will ultimately be made right, that justice will prevail. In the case of school shootings, though, many times, most times, almost all, the shooters kill themselves, and there can be no justice. And so we struggle. There's a situation where justice can't be brought up. Even if the shooter survives, how can a court bring justice out of one individual for killing 26 others, 20 of them young children, five and six years old. How could any court bring justice from that? So the next thing we turn to is understanding. We try to understand what is that motivated someone to do such an awful, horrible thing? And we find, maybe we find in their history, in their background, abuse physical, sexual, emotional abuse, and didn't say, oh, this, this person was disturbed, they were mentally ill, no wonder, they just snapped. Or maybe they find in the background a perceived injustice done to the killer or to a family member, and so we say, oh, I, we see, this was an act of twisted, sick vengeance. Or maybe we discover that there was a breakup from a girlfriend in the recent past, and so we say, oh, this was a desperate act of revenge. We find all sorts of these explanations. 
And in some strange way, it gives us some measure of comfort. It makes us feel a little better. Because at least we can understand in some small way what might have driven somebody to do such terrible things. And the need for justice is somehow met, or somehow partially met, by understanding these causal factors in the actions of these people. <coughs> Gregory McGuire wrote a fictional novel called Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West. In this fictional novel, he fills in the backstory of the Wicked Witch of the West, that, that green cackling woman of infamy on The Wizard of Oz, and he gives her backstory, and he talks about wouldn't it have been hard to be born green? <laughs> Think about the kids at school. And he talks about how growing up she had all this difficulty in school. How the other kids made fun. She was ostracized by the other people in her school. He goes on to talk about how hard this was. And she got to college and her roommate Glinda, who becomes the good witch of the north, was a snob who mistreated her, was arrogant, made fun of her. So naturally, with all this background, we can understand that eventually all of this hurtful action against her would lead her naturally down the path of wickedness. And we can excuse her and understand why she would attack poor little Dorothy, who incidentally was one of her playmates as a child, who made fun of her, and Toto, and try to hurt them. Naturally, we can see how this terrible background would lead to a life of wickedness. McGuire also wrote the book Confessions of an Ugly Stepsister. Could you imagine growing up with that title? Hey, ugly, what's going on? And it, we can see how this might twist somebody's morality over a lifetime of mistreatment. For many, it seems that all these hardships or mental illnesses uh, are mitigating circumstances that help to serve to justify someone's awful, hateful, hurtful, evil, selfish action. <clears throat> let's, let's imagine for a second that we do this with King Herod. Now, I kept thinking, I, I put in, when I first started, I was praying about which passages to choose, and for some reason I chose to include this passage about King Herod. God was, I guess, pushing me to do this, and every time I come back to work on the sermon, you know, I chose these passages six weeks ago, by the way. I chose it six weeks ago before any of this happened. So I chose this passage. God was telling me, choose this passage, choose this passage. And every time I come back to think about the sermon, I read it and say, you know, that passage doesn't really fit, God. Why did you have me pick that? And every, I go to erase it. I go to cut it out. I say, no, I'll just leave it there. I won't use it, but I'll just leave it there. And I go to cut it out. I say, no, I'll just leave it sit there for now. I won't use it. And then... And for some reason, God said, no, don't cut it out. Leave it there. Leave it there. But think about it if we take this and we do this with King Herod. He was king of the Jews. He had worked hard to become king of the Jews. And now some wise men have come to him and said, hey, we're looking for the newborn baby king of the Jews. Your replacement. Listen to his response as the wise men say, we're looking for the new king of the Jews. Not you the new king of the Jews. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. He sent, and uh, so he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When the wise men did come back and tell him where to find this baby, they didn't come back and identify him, this is what he did. He sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or older according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Herod had worked hard to become the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. He had connived his way up the ladder. He had switched allegiance from one emperor to another because the emperor that he had backed had ultimately failed and been killed. And so he switched his allegiance to the other emperor. He had several of his immediate family members killed because he was afraid they may try to usurp his power. And with good reason, because many of them did. He even had four of his own sons killed because they were trying, he felt they were trying to take over. 
He escaped various assassination attempts and plots. He had earned his place as king of the Jews, and he was not about to give that up to some little baby. He deserved it, and he justified his murderous actions because of it. But consider all the good that Aaron did. Think about all the good things he did. He built entire cities from scratch. He imported an upgrade to sustain the entire population of Israel during a drought, a severe drought that would have taken hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. He undertook amazing architectural feats, many of which still stand 2,000 years later. He financially underwrote the entire Olympic Games so that when they were financially struck, so that they were insured of their continuation. He rebuilt the temple so marvelously that the only remains of the temple today are the temple that he had built 2,000 years ago. Herod was an amazing, amazing kid. His accomplishments were so amazing that he earned the title Herod the Great. Some might suggest that his bad deeds were balanced out by all the good deeds that he did. All the people that he killed versus all the people that he saved and maybe justify some of his actions in keeping his place as king. Consider the fact that he probably suffered from mental illness. He probably had some kind of um, diagnosable paranoia. Right? But does that excuse the act of slaughtering innocent children in Bethlehem, two years old? Does that excuse the fact that he killed all those babies? What Herod did was wrong. It was selfish and for personal gain and violent and evil. And he will answer in God's court of justice. And so it will be for all people who have who are evil in their actions or selfish, whether those actions are large or small. We know that the shooter in Connecticut will answer for his actions, but he's not the only one. All evil actions will be answered for in God's court of justice. In our Advent series, we've been looking at the people who anticipated the first Christ the coming of the first Messiah, with his second coming, the second coming of Christ. We've been looking at what do we find that is comparable in their prayers, tying it in with our uh, focus on prayer in 2012. We've been asking, what of the first people, the people who were waiting for Christ to come 2,000 years ago, what did they pray? And what of the people who are waiting for Christ's second arrival, what, did they, what sorts of prayers did they pray and trying to tie those two together? In today's sermon, what we see is that in both the first and second arrival, we see people praying for justice. In Mary's prayer, which we found in Luke chapter 1, I'm going to have to turn there. Give me one second. In Luke chapter 1, we hear these words from Mary. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has scattered those who are proud. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent away the rich empty. He has helped his servant. He remembers to be merciful. Mary knows that God is a just God. And now, having come to find Elizabeth pregnant just as the angel predicted and told her she was, even in her old age, she knows that God's promise will come true. She knows that she is bearing God's chosen Messiah and that she will be vindicated, that justice will prevail. As I talked with the kids, they know, she knew, that she was going to be made fun of for the rest of her life. She knew that she would be mocked, ridiculed, and scorned, but she knew that ultimately people would call her blessed. And that's how we treat her today. We lift her up. In fact, even some people worship her. We should respect her, and we should um, uh, call her blessed by God because that's what the angel called her. She was chosen by God for a great honor, and through her suffering, King, Messiah, who saves the world. And we turn to Revelation, what we find, so she knows that she will be vindicated, 
as she prays for God's vindication, even as she's celebrating its arrival. We turn to Revelation, and we find the same prayer by those 